feel like I should lay down on this. I know, we're going to be... Tell me how you feel today. <laughs> yeah. We're going to be doing uh, corporate therapy. I like that, I like that. <laughs> So, uh, you know, everybody knows, not everybody, but certainly Americans know GoDaddy. We've all had fantasies of watching the next great app and, or website and then found out that, damn, somebody else already occupies that domain name, <laughs> you know, right. buy.com. Oh, sounded like a good idea. But tell me, what are you doing out here in Asia? What, what are the plans? Uh, well, so I was in um, the Philippines the day before yesterday launching our new website builder product, which is a super easy DIY very inexpensive, free trial way to go build a website without even getting a domain. So you can go build it, you can construct the thing, and then roll it out. And you know, we entered Asia last February, 11 countries. Uh, we're experiencing 20% growth pan-Asian. Uh, in some countries, 25% growth, which is terrific. Uh, and, and being here and being able to actually you know, talk with folks that are in market, talk with entrepreneurs that are in market that are trying to figure out what they want to do next uh, is why I'm here. And the RISE conference actually was a, a, a big reason for me coming as well. Yeah, you were saying that a lot of your growth now is, is uh, international, right? It's no longer a domestic story for you guys. Yeah, I mean, Go GoDaddy's been around 20 years. The first 15 years, uh, it was strictly a U.S.-based company. You know, proudly in Phoenix, Arizona, really didn't have offices outside of Phoenix and Iowa. Now we're in... Uh, San Francisco, Sunnyvale, Seattle, Cambridge, Massachusetts. We're in 56 countries uh, globally. We've uh, got most of our customers coming from out of the country now. Over 50% of our new customers come from out of the United States. Uh, we're at 17 million customers now, about 7 million of those from outside the U.S. That's phenomenal. Now, how do you, you know, uh, I, I'm now at a startup. We're, t we're, we're maybe a little bit over two dozen people. And we're already trying to figure out systems for communication and, you know, memos, and it's already becoming complicated. How do you grow and scale? Yeah. You started off, I think, with 30 people, and, and, and now you're 8,000 or something? Yeah, so, the, you know, like most startups, right? The, like, GoDaddy was founded. GoDaddy was called Joe Max Technologies. Seriously, that was the name of the company. Well, we're, we're they were just... on Joe Max Road in Scottsdale, Arizona, in a house. The data center was in the laundry room. They actually had cables going through the dryer vent. You know, that's where they had their, you know, ISDN line or whatever it was. It was feeding the, you know, the, the data center. Um, that was, you know, 18 years ago. Now, we're about 7,500 employees globally. We have nine data centers. Um, you know, the communication process and how you keep in touch with your employees is the same as it was back then. You know, as a CEO, I, I, I have, I, I, I like to say, look, you know, lead from the front, but be in the mosh pit, not on the stage. So you make sure that you have communication with everybody that's in the company. Uh, and I think the way that we inculcate, you know, the way we produce culture makes it really easy to communicate with me, communicate with the other leaders in the company, and uh, feel like you're in touch with the leadership so you can give instant feedback on things that you think are good and things that you think are bad. Okay, that's easier said than done. What are the actual processes you have in place? I mean, you, after all, are the guy who signs people's checks, and that's yeah. just intrinsically intimidating, right? So how do you, how do you keep from being in a bubble of yes men? Uh, you know, women? you eat lunch in the lunchroom. You go ha hang out by the food trucks. You make sure that you act and behave and look like the rest of the employees of the company. I uh, usually, like, this is dressed up for me. I usually wear shorts to work. I walk the floor. I stop in people's cubes. I ask them what's going on. Uh, and I like to get bad news and good news, um, and I do that in every office that we've, that we've got. Also, you know, I, I have a philosophy of kind of bring your best self to work and make sure that the person you are at home is the person you are at work, that First three years I was at GoDaddy, I actually had our yearly planning offsites in my garage at home. So my leadership team would say like, oh, this dude's exactly the same at home as he is in the office. And that's what you try to get everybody in the company to feel like they can do. So how can you do that once you grow beyond a, a team that can fit in your garage? Yeah. You know, you got, you got staff all across the world, yeah. you know, how do you, especially like offices that are far away, how do you, you know, inculcate them with your corporate culture? You, you know, you try to, it's hard, 
It's not easy. Uh, I use social media. I make sure that I post a lot so folks know like what I'm actually doing. Are you on Slack? Yeah, I'm on Slack. <sighs> of course, I mean, Slack's a huge development tool for us. Really? Yeah, it's a very important thing. Interesting. Yeah, Slack so and GitHub both. But then I'm also on Facebook. I'm also on Twitter. You know, that's all. And Facebook and Twitter for your own corporate internal kind of talk. For both. Like, I, I mean, I actually, people know that, like, I, I publish a lot of stuff publicly about, you know, going and seeing, you know, Rage Against the Machine, or actually Prophets of Rage, they are now called. Mm. But, like, going and seeing bands and, and being, you know, a real human that has likes and dislikes that are inside and outside of work and make it comfortable for people to do the same. So how do you, how do you like your bad news delivered? In a memo? No, just face-to-face. Like, people can write it in an email. Like, a memo, I don't even know what a memo is anymore, but, like, in an email or a, a, a instant message or a text, it, it doesn't matter. What I'd rather do is actually have the human contact where I'm looking somebody in the eyes and they can say, man, here's what happened. This did not go well. Uh, and I think that's the way most people like to have their good news or bad news delivered. I always broke up by text. I found that that was the safest <laughs> way to, um, you know, not, not get clobbered. So, you, you know, you, you guys have done this expansion, but you've also, so you've transformed yourself from an American-centric company to a, a, a globally facing one. You've also uh, had to change internally a lot of the culture. You sort of had a kind of a, I don't know, what's the word you want to use for the back in the day? Let, let, I'll let you define it. Uh, you know, I think the way that we projected ourselves outside in the public was um, shock and awe, right? And I think we did, we did Super Bowl advertising, you know, a decade ago that is etched in people's minds pretty deeply. <clears throat> that was, you know, not honoring women as hardworking business people, but using them in an objectified fashion. Um, the people inside the company were extremely different. They love their customers. They think if they look, lean into something and put their shoulder into it, they can make anything happen. And that kind of two brand truths was one of the reasons I got excited about coming to the company because the first call that I got when uh, I took the role I was like, GoDaddy, well, you know, I know their ads. You know, I've been a customer for five years. I've got 40, I think I had 45 domains under management when I took the role. Just ideas that I had that I thought I could, you know, the same thing you just talked about when we started the conversation. I had an idea. I thought I could turn it into something on the web. So I got the domain. I secured the intellectual property. I knew that there was something there. The advertising I didn't square with. I met the people in the company and they were all about people like me that had an idea and wanted mm. to do something with it. So it was like, wow, what would this look like if we flatten the platform, wrote APIs so partners could use it, globalize the software, we could take it around the world, and what if we squared our marketing messages with who we are, what we do, and who we do it for? And that's effectively what we've been doing. So the outward projection of the company has changed dramatically. Our aided brand awareness in the United States is 80%, which is huge. Our aided brand awareness in India, which we've only been in for four and a half years, is 79%. Because we've been doing the same playbook, kind of not shock and awe anymore because we don't need to do that. Funny, engaging, about our customers, telling some brand truths about the little entrepreneur who's trying to figure out how they make something happen. Uh, and it's actually created a pretty big business for us. I mean, we'll be, you know, Shy of three billion dollars in revenue this year, but you know, on, from a bookings perspective, we're you know deep into the twos. Uh, and you know, four and a half years ago, we were a billion-dollar company. So we've you know doubled the size of the company in the last four years plus, uh, and have just seen really good trajectory, building on that brand truth of fighting the fight for the little guy, helping people get online and be successful. You said something else in term that was really when we spoke earlier about. Uh, the number of female uh, engineers coming into your company, which I thought was, was striking. You talk yeah, about that well, a bit. interestingly enough, so when, we, when you shift a brand pretty, pretty firmly in a direction where people are used to seeing you projected in one way, and then you start showing women as small business, like our advertising today shows women as business people that are fighting the fight, that are working hard. Uh, I've actually had very transparent conversations about to very large audiences about what we did for 10 years as an advertiser, what we do now, how the company has shifted, and how much we're actually 
pouring into making sure gender equality mm -hmm. for engineers and frankly everybody in business is seen and we're sort of shining a light in places that people have been really nervous about. We have published our salary data by position, by level, on how much women make versus men. We've published data on promotion trajectory for women plus men. We have actually had the Clayman Institute, which is a gender bias research organization at Stanford University, come in and audit the entire company's procedures. Is Uber taking notes? Anybody from Uber here? Just you taking notes? Go, go on. <laughs> and, and literally went through and had her audit our calibration. I had Lori, who's one of the principals there, audit our calibration meeting of the senior execs calibrating the top 100 people and telling us whether our language was appropriate or inappropriate on how we talk about men versus women. Businesses tend to talk about women with style and not about what they got stuff done. And we actually saw that we had issues, right? And changed the way that we behave. We changed the language in our promotion, uh, our promotion and our uh, processes of hiring, recruiting, of uh, d determining whether somebody's ready for a promotion, whether they're they're coming into the company uh, fresh. Like, so we, we changed a ton on how we talk about performance, how we describe a job, because you know, I think a lot of companies, you, you made an Uber joke, but like putting a description of, you know, we want a code ninja up there is more of a, a guy gamification thing than it is hmm. for a woman. Very typical. We found it in our docs. We changed it all. And so when we're calibrating an employee, when we're doing a performance review, we make sure that the language that's in that performance review is as neutralized as possible. And we also have done a thing where we, every, for the first three years of employment, make sure that everybody, men or women, regardless of race, creed, color, whatever, gets a, re, a, a promotion review and here's a, an odd uh, fact that if a, if a man is 30% qualified for a role, he thinks he's ready. And he's like, man, I'm ready to go. If a woman is 80% qualified for a role, she will say, you know, I'm, I'm missing 20% of the qualifications for this. I don't think I'm qualified yet. And that's a gender difference. So what we've done is actually made sure that everybody in the company for the first three years of employment gets a promotion review, regardless of if they ask, because oh, a promotion woman will generally ask. I see. In other words, so the, the men are kind of full of BS. <laughs> women are much more uh, self-critical and judgmental, so they won't raise their hand. So a performance review is the company will actively tell them, look, let's look at you whether or not you should get ahead. Whether, regardless, you don't have to promote yourself for the promotion. The company's actively that, asking we're, and We're seeking. actively asking. And, and there was this other very odd thing that we saw, and I, we call it paying it backward. Um, we, had, we had two roles for, well, I'll start with a premise. I was walking out to our cars at the end of the day with my uh, head of HR, and I said, you know, man, I, I think that what's happening, you know, in the, in the valley, in the, in the technology industry generally is that they're, I would wager that women, because they haven't negotiated for salary, they haven't negotiated for promotion as often as men do, that I bet you that they're actually taking it with them to the next company that they go to. Because, you know, you guys all know how promotion mechanics or when you go to a new company works. You're, you're going to the new company. Uh, when we're you know, evaluating whether we're going to hire somebody, we're saying, okay, what are you making? Okay, well, we'll give you a 20% bump in salary. This is what your bonus will be. It will give you this much equity based on what you were making before. So if a guy has continually negotiated his way into a good salary, et cetera, and a woman hasn't, Quite possibly, when they come to your company, there's a disparity between those two equally qualified candidates. Right. We, ha we had this magnificent opportunity where we hired, we had two openings for vice presidents in product management. And we hired a guy from a big company in the Valley, gave him an offer, negotiated the offer, accepted the offer. Two weeks later, we hired a woman for the other position. Exact same position. Negotiated the offer, made the offer, accepted the offer, and I asked my CHRO, I said, can you go look at these two offers and let's just see what the differences are. Same job, 
I just have a sneaking suspicion that we might be doing it. Right, she's the legacy of... The legacy of bringing her salary disparity with her into her next company without even knowing it. Right. And we looked at the two salaries, the $15,000 difference between the two, not huge, but a pretty reasonable For gap. For a person, that's, yeah, that's And funny. there was an equity gap. And uh, we rescinded the offer to the woman. We gave her a new offer that was exactly matching the offer that we gave the man for the same role. Um, had we not done that, we would have been perpetuating the same issue that the entire valley sees. I don't get to catch all those. Right, like, so how do you, okay, so the question then is, that's great, I'm gonna be a jerk. How does this help your bottom line? That woman, if not paid appropriately, wouldn't stay in the company. She's one of the best product management people we have. She's a GM now. The guy's no longer in the company. She's fantastic. And had we not taken that step, and had I not demonstrated with that step that that is something that we care about, I'd lose her, and I probably wouldn't be able to recruit a whole lot of women that she has brought into the company saying, like, these guys do what's right. They put their money where their mouth is. And, you know, if I use my last college recruiting session as an example, so last year college recruiting, our new college graduate hires were 50% women in the engineering community, which is unheard of uh, in tech today. Engineering, it's we, should, we should emphasize it's not HR, it's not these sort of traditional... No, no, it's, yeah. Are, yeah, but no, it's actually engineers. Like, these are computer scientists, these are coders. And 50% of them were women straight out of college which is, you know, double the population coming out of college. Now, that was a target or just kind of happened? Just kind of happened. I mean, we, we spend time recruiting women. We spend time because, frankly, we think a diverse team makes better products. Your, your, product, your product teams ought to look a hell of a lot like your customer base in terms of diversity because you're going to be sensitive to things that you otherwise wouldn't be. Um, so it's a goal of ours to try to get as close to parity as we possibly can. Small company like mine, you know, I'm not Microsoft. 8,000 people is small, okay. Well, well. We'll let that slide. Let that slide, but like, I'm not Microsoft. I, I don't have, you know, 100,000 people. I'm not Google, I don't have 100,000 people. Harder problem to solve in those companies than it is, you know, for me where I have, you know, 1,000 engineers. Um, so we're, we're putting our money where our mouth is and we think it pays dividends. Um. I didn't realize, but I, th I see this, a string of zeros, which means that our time is up. Uh, and I, I have all these questions that we didn't even get to. Yeah, shy. Well, I'm yeah. inefficient. You're going to sack me. What are you going to do? All right. Well, listen, I hope you guys enjoyed this as much as I did. Uh, and thank you so much. Thanks, Shai.